Hello, this is Dr. Roger Kobayashi from Omaha, Nebraska, and also from the UCLA Medical Center. So first of all, I'd like to thank Professor Chow and the organizing committee of the Vietnamese Respiratory Society, and also Ms. Mi, who was very patient in getting uh, the slides prepared and reminding us of the deadlines. I'd especially like to thank Professor Fan Mang Hung, who was Vice Minister of Health in uh, Vietnam when my wife and I first came over 20 years ago. Professor Hung looked at us as his younger brother and sister and took good care of us. And to this day, we are very grateful for all his contributions to uh, Vietnam and immunology. Also to Professor Zung, and Professor Dong at the Military Medical University uh, for their work, especially to Dr. Lei Hung and her colleagues at the Vietnamese National Children's Hospital and their work in establishing pediatric immunology in Vietnam. And then finally to my wife who does everything for me and points me in the right direction, uh, Dr. Ailan Kobayashi. In this, uh, in this picture, it reminds me of my classmates uh, 52 years ago. These are bright, very eager, enthusiastic uh, young doctors. It is our hope that they will study harder than we did, become more successful than we did. And to our future young doctors, it is our obligation to pass on to them our knowledge and aspirations. Just a few disclosures. I am clinical professor at UCLA and have been in private practice uh, as well. I follow 320 patients on IVIG, and I'm also a lecturer at the Military Medical University in Hanoi. Okay, there is the diagnostic dilemma of suspecting immunodeficiency. As I've said earlier in the discussion, respiratory infections are very common. Low respiratory tract infections are common, as, and we can see in the following slides. They are the most common uh, problem seen by pediatricians and family practitioners. Similarly, the most important respiratory infections uh, are, well, the most common presentation in primary immune deficiency is chronic respiratory infections. So the question is, how do we distinguish between these two? Now, the big point is that in the uh, British Medical Journal Pulmonary Medicine, they said that in acute low respiratory infections, about 10 to 40% of hospitalizations are due to this problem. In the world, 6.6 .6 million children under the age of five die. 95% of these who are dying from low respiratory tract infections are in developing nations. And for example, in Cameroon, a major hospital, 54% of the hospital visits and admissions were due to lower respiratory tract uh, infections. And so the question is, how do you separate uh, the normal child who has frequent infections normally uh, and decide whether one of these individuals is an immunodeficient patient? Okay, so... There are a couple of important points. Number one is that respiratory tract infections throughout history have been a huge and major problem. In England, which is uh, at the time in the 1700s and the 1800s, along with Germany, the most advanced country um, medical wise. And as you can see from this uh, article from Dr. Schulman from Northwestern, Two thirds of the children in England in the late 1700s died before the age of five and 75% died before the age of two. And the major cause of these deaths in these young children back in the 17 and 1800s was due to pertussis, diphtheria, croup, influenza, TB, measles, haemophilus influenza, streptococcal pneumonia, and other bacterial pneumonia. So it was a very, very common cause of death in children. In the 1880s in Germany, pertussis and diphtheria were major causes of infant mortality and childhood mortality, as was bacterial pneumonia. And as you can see in the lower left, in the United States in, the, in 1900, 
the morbidity from diphtheria was considerable, about 180,000 cases per year. Whooping cough or pertussis, about 150,000 cases per year. year. Uh, measles, over 500,000 cases. Haemophilus influenza, pneumonia, 20,000 cases. And streptococcal pneumonia was uh, even higher uh, than that. Now, if you look at the United States in 2020, diphtheria is almost zero. Pertussis is very low, as is measles. Haemophilus influenza has been almost eliminated, and pneumococcal pneumonia because of the vaccine has similarly become quite unusual. Now, what is the burden in terms of the uh, world? There was a publication in Lancet Respiratory uh, Medicine in January 2020, where it looked between the years of 1990 and 2007. And this was a study looking at the global burden of disease where 195 countries uh, reported their incidences and their infant um, mortality due to respiratory infections under the age of five. And you can see the number of children under five dying from respiratory infections in the world in 1990 was 2,400,000. In 2017, it was more than uh, two-thirds reduced. So it went from 2.3 million down to 800,000 patients. So this is a considerable reduction. The mortality rate, that is uh, the number per 100,000, went from, in 1990, 363 per 100,000, reduced to 119 per 100,000. And this represented a significant decrease. And the incidence of lower respiratory tract infections in the world decreased by 32%. And what were the important factors? Well, surely public health policy, uh, sanitation, good environmental um, care uh, was important, but also the pneumococcal and haemophilus influenza vaccines, which were introduced in the 1970s and 1980s uh, and became more widespread throughout the world certainly decreased uh, the uh, mortality. Also in many of the developing countries, uh, cooking with wood is done indoors or with coal and this indoor air pollution contributed to uh, susceptibility to respiratory tract infections and deaths. Now, the most deaths that were seen in the world occurred in India, Nigeria, and Pakistan. These are large countries. Uh, however, the highest mortality rate was in the South Sudan, as we'll see in the map. So here you can see a map in 2015, deaths due to lower respiratory tract infections uh, in children less than five years old. You can see that there's still, despite the marked progress, uh, that there are areas in the world that have significant deaths due to lower respiratory tract infections. Now, this is a complicated slide again, but we want to repeat and, and emphasize how serious lower respiratory tract infections were in the past uh, in the European uh, nations and also in the United States, but also now, even to this day, a major problem in the developing nations. But here you can see from the archives of childhood, 1945 on the left, this is in England and Wales again, the most advanced medical uh, country along with Germany. You can see back in 1855, uh, the uh, mortality rates due to respiratory infections approximated, and I'll convert it to 100,000, 100 per 100,000 uh, in 1855. And then you could see it decreasing quite a bit on the right side down in 1935. And it's like the United States, this has now approximated close to a zero in 2021. Now in the New England Journal of Medicine, again, uh, table two, uh, this was at the beginning of the uh, 1900. Uh, you can see diphtheria cases, 175,000 in, in the United States, pertussis, 150,000 and so forth. So this was huge. And then when you look at 1998, so this is uh, 23 years ago, uh, 
you can see that the great reduction uh, in the incidence of these diseases due again to public health policy, environmental and sanitary control, as well as vaccines and antibiotics. And on the graph below, this visualizes it. So you can see from the er early 1940s, late 1930s, uh, going out to the late uh, 1990s, how the death rate from respiratory infections and pneumonia have decreased all the way up from an incidence of about seven per, uh, 70 per 100,000 down to almost uh, less than five per 100,000. So that's a great improvement. So we have seen remarkable progress due to public health vaccinations, antibiotics, antivirals, and monoclonals. But despite all of these great improvements, uh, patients with immune deficiency, despite all this treatment, still get sick. And I think this is critical. So we'll just briefly talk about public health. There have been great strides, as we've said, uh, particularly in education and prevention. The vaccines that have come out, pertussis, diphtheria, in the late uh, 1910s to 1920s and further development in the 1940s. Pneumococcal H influenza vaccine, uh, in the 1970s, uh, measles vaccine in the 1960s, uh, and influenza vaccines have all done much to prevent these infections. Again, in the early part of the 1900s, uh, before antibiotics were available, and certainly before World War II, uh, death from pneumonia and bacterial infections and respiratory infections were common. It was not until the sulfas and penicillins came in and the other antibiotics that made a big help. And then antivirals have also helped out uh, because of AIDS, we've developed antivirals to influenza and now of course COVID. And the mon monoclonals are an application of an old principle back in the turn of the century and uh, early 1900s. Kitasato and Von Behring used uh, serum, uh, animal serum to prevent the complications of diphtheria uh, and then also whooping cough, uh, pneumococcal pneumonia, et cetera. And now we are making specific antibodies to treat, uh, if you will, COVID and other infections such as RSV. The problem is with primary immune deficiency is that the underlying reason for them getting infection, infections and severe infections is still there. So although we treat with the monoclonals, the antibiotics, et cetera, these patients still continue to develop problems. And so you must diagnose uh, primary immune deficiency. You must treat appropriately and you have to anticipate problems and complications. Otherwise, in many instances, infections will occur. And as you have seen, and as I have seen, we have a number of these patients who are not diagnosed properly, uh, not diagnosed early, not treated appropriately, treated repeatedly with antibiotics, develop complications from bronchiectasis, chronic lung disease, uh, and so forth, and sometimes even, unfortunately, passed away. So this is an important one because in this case report, this was the first case of primary immune deficiency, but it makes a very important point because even back in the late 1940s, early 1950s, Colonel Bruton did a superb job of diagnosing and proving that immune deficiency was the cause of repeated infections. And all of us can still learn lessons as to how to, the basic principles of evaluating and treating these patients. So this was published in Pediatrics in 1952, and, they re, and Colonel Bruton reported an eight-year-old male who had 19 episodes of clinical sepsis with strep pneumonia over four years and was given repeated uh, doses of uh, antibiotics, including penicillins and others. The Schick test was positive. Uh, and I think, I really think the Schick test should be brought back. This test is a test where you're using the diphtheria toxin and you inject it intradermally. And if the patient has functional or makes antibodies against the diphtheria toxin, the test will be negative. In other words, it will neutralize the toxin. If the patient makes no antibodies to diphtheria, despite being vaccinated, uh, the patient will have 
a positive test. In other words, the toxin will cause a red area. And this patient, despite numerous uh, diphtheria vaccinations, still did not make antibodies that neutralized the Schick test. The patient also had no antibodies against strep pneumonia, despite repeated sepsis, pneumonia, and otitis. He was vaccinated with typhoid and despite that had no antibody uh, response to the typhoid vaccine. And interestingly enough, at Walter Reed Hospital, they had a Tacilius machine that looked at protein electrophoresis. And when this child came in, uh, they thought, well, let's do a uh, protein electrophoresis. And at that time, the gamma globulin spike with infections went way up because IgG and uh, immunoglobulins go up in inflammation and infection. Much to their surprise, the gamma globulin spike was absent. So they thought there was a laboratory error. They repeated the test and it was absent. And it was that clue and the astuteness of Colonel Bruton that made him realize no gamma globulin spike, no antibodies, no antibodies, repeated infections. And so they gave uh, replacement gamma globulin subcutaneously every month. And you will notice that they gave it subcutaneously uh, and later, unfortunately, intramuscularly, because right now we do subcutaneously more than we do intravenously. The second thing you will note is that the amount of gamma globulin they gave was very small, 3.2. An eight-year-old child would probably weigh about 30 kilograms, so we would be giving him 12 grams a month. So they're giving him about a fourth of the dose. But because even that low dose, no sepsis was seen for at least one year in follow-up. This was in contrast to having at least 10 different infections of serotypes with 19 septic episodes. So what did this demonstrate? Number one, they demonstrated that with the gamma globulin spike missing, that antibodies were necessary to fight infection. Number two, when they replaced the gamma globulin, the infections disappeared. And this is important as we go on to talk about other slides. Now, when they did not give gamma globulin, after six weeks, the gamma globulin disappeared from the child's uh, serum. And the reason why was obviously he wasn't making it. So because of this observation and because of this uh, other doctors began to describe uh, other forms of primary immune deficiency. And now we have over 400 different forms of immune deficiency. However, I would point out that antibody deficiencies are the most common. They are treatable, and it is incumbent upon us to diagnose this and treat these patients. So it's important to know the presentation of primary immune deficiency in children. Even though it's rare, it typically presents early in life. You have severe recurrent respiratory tract infections or GI infections. They're typically incompletely or poor responsive to antibiotics and other measures. They may have unusual presentations. Important point is multiple organ involvement, such as the sinuses, lungs, ears, all at the same time, or they may have unusual uh, microorganisms. You can also have patients, particularly with cellular immune deficiencies, failure to thrive is quite common uh, in young children, uh, unusual physical features, unusual facies, uh, bleeding, etc. Many will have a positive family history. Uh, and finally, antibody cellular or phagocytic defects may present differently. And so you ought to look at that. Antibodies typically present with lung uh, and sinus and GI infections. Cellular can present with uh, failure to thrive, GI, severe GI infections, and also lung infections. Phagocytic infections typically with abscesses in the lungs, sinuses, bone, and skin. Again, in children, immunodeficiency is relatively rare. I would point out very strongly because most of the people I imagine in the audience are adult uh, physicians and pulmonologists. Primary immune deficiency is very common uh, in adults. They're very common in older individuals. In fact, we presented data at the Clinical Immunology Society that demonstrated that there are more individuals over the age of 65 receiving gamma globulin replacement therapy 
than there are people, uh, children younger than 17. And it's almost an 80% uh, ratio of adults versus children in terms of antibody uh, deficiency. So this is something to look at. However, in children, there are a couple of antibody deficiencies which we should talk about. Uh, some of them are common and fortunately not serious. Uh, some of them are very serious, but fortunately uncommon. But you must make the diagnosis because failure to do that will result in serious consequences. The first is physiologic hypogammaglobinemia that you see in the left-hand corner. All babies, after you cut the mother's uh, umbilical cord, uh, normally at birth, they start off with IgG levels, about 1,000, and the half-life is 21 to 28 days. So by the time you're out at one month, it's down to 500. Out at two months, you're down to 250. So about two to three months, it drops. And then the baby is starting to make his own, so the thing will reverse. Now, in some individuals, it will not reverse at all, and these could be serious uh, problems that we'll go on to talk about. And it is at that point, typically about six months to a year, where patients uh, with immune deficiency due to antibodies will present. A more benign form is the next one, transient hypogammaglobinemia of infancy. And in this one, they have the normal physiologic drop. In other words, the mother's gamma globulin is metabolized, baby uh, begins to make his own. However, in those with transient hypogammaglobinemia, they don't start making their own immunoglobulin right away. And so it stays low. And although most of these children don't get sick and therefore are not diagnosed, uh, a number of them do get sick with frequent infections, uh, generally not severe life-threatening infections, but they can have bacterial infections. They can be hospitalized and you can detect them. And we've had a number of these individuals. Usually by the age of three to six years of age, their immune system kicks in. They start making immunoglobulins and they're fine. There are some individuals after the age of six that have transient hypogammaglobinemia, but still have problems making immunoglobulin. And sometimes we'll need supplementation with gamma globulin. In other words, receive gamma globulin for one to three years. And by the time they're age nine to 12, you can stop that and they make their own. IgA deficiency is the most common, but most of the patients have no symptoms. Uh, IgA is very low or absent in babies. And it's not until age uh, 16 that they develop normal adult levels. And so generally we make the diagnosis of IgA deficiency when they have levels uh, less than uh, seven. And typically we don't make the diagnosis until they're about six uh, to eight years. Subclass deficiency uh, is also uh, relatively uncommon. Uh, it is thought that in combination with mannose binding deficiency, they may have uh, more infections. Uh, the patients with IgG2 subclass deficiency combined with mannose binding lectin, they have problems making antibodies against bacteria that have polysaccharide covers, such as pneumococcus and haemophilus influenza. And these individuals get sick all the time, and some of them may need replacement therapy. Now, in fo following up and finishing up, the, the, infection, uh, the diseases on the right side are very rare, but very serious. Uh, X-linked A-gamma globinemia, the case that I presented, occurs in about one in 200,000 uh, individuals. Typically, this presents at age six months or so, and we'll show you more detailed data from Vietnam. Uh, if untreated, they all die. Now, as we have said, we have th uh, four cases of these patients with Bruton's A gamma globinemia who were diagnosed in the 1950s, given gamma globulin replacement, initially IM. And as you have seen, you cannot give high doses, uh, but nevertheless, they stop having infections, sepsis, uh, and pneumonias, and they are in their 60s and 70s. The patients that we diagnose now uh, and diagnose early can expect to have a normal lifespan Unless they, develop, unless they develop one of the complications. Wiscott Aldridge is very rare. This is one in 100,000. These typically present in the newborn with 
uh, bloody diarrhea, bleeding, petechiae, recurrent uh, severe um, infections due to polysaccharide or pyogenic bacteria. Uh, they have abnormal platelets and they have other abnormalities such as autoimmunity, increased incidence of cancer. And finally, the most common severe primary immune deficiency in adults, that is common variable immunodeficiency, is actually very hard to diagnose in children because of transient hypogammaglobinemia, as we have talked about. So typically, we do not diagnose these patients until age six. The incidence is about one in uh, 25,000 individuals. So I think I gave several lectures in Vietnam on this disease. So there are probably about 200 patients in Hanoi uh, with this problem, given the population of Hanoi. Okay, this was a wonderful study just to show you a couple of things. Number one, that primary immune deficiency occurs in Vietnam. Number two, Vietnam now has the capability of recognizing, diagnosing, and treating these individuals. And great credit goes to Dr. Le Hum and her group uh, at the Children's Hospital. Uh, this was a paper published in Frontiers in Immunology, I think in 2018 or 2019. Uh, you can see here that we studied 20 patients. They have now over 30 patients. There are several things that are important about this study. While the patients were diagnosed in Vietnam, either by family history, recurrent infections, and low gamma globulin levels, uh, and also testing for functional antibodies, we were able, with the help of Dr. Hans Ox and Dr. Segundo from the University of Washington, with these blood spots, where we put them on a blotter, uh, we ship them to the research laboratory or the clinical laboratory at the University of Washington, and they did genetic studies, as you can see. There are several interesting things that I would like to point out in this complicated slide. Number one, if you look at the onset of symptoms, most of these patients presented before the age of one. So if you have these individuals getting sick with pneumonia, sepsis, meningitis, septic arthritis, you, you should look at particularly if these are males and particularly if there's a positive family history. If you look at the age of diagnosis, uh, some of these individuals were not diagnosed until 10 to 12 years later. By then they had bronchiectasis. Some of them had meningitis with brain damage, et cetera. However, you can see that on some of the patients, notably the one at the top where they, there was only a two month delay in diagnosis. So hopefully as you diagnose these individuals more quickly and more readily, uh, they can be treated and all of the complications can be prevented and hopefully they will live to 60 and 70 years old, just like the four patients we have that we are following. The other thing I would like to point out is that if you look at the column under IgG, all of these individuals had markedly decreased IgG, typically less than 100. If you look at IgM and IgA, they were basically undetectable. And the main problem with this disease is that while they have immature B cells, they do not have the signal or the messenger RNA to cause them to develop and uh, mature. So finally, how do we go on to diagnose primary immune deficiency? Well, now uh, in Europe, uh, well, mainly in the United States, all 50 states, and in some countries in Europe, there is newborn screening. So we can screen for the Severe combined immunodeficiency, this is the one that has no cellular immunity, no antibody or humoral immunity. Uh, and we can also screen for Bruton's A gamma globinemia by CREC uh, screening, but we can also diagnose that by antibodies. So mainly the newborn screening now uh, is for severe combined immunodeficiency, otherwise known as the Houston bubble child disease. These patients typically present, like we've said, at birth or within six months of life. They have failure to thrive. And if they have problems with not growing, with severe GI uh, infections, complications, uh, they can also have severe pneumonias, you should think about cellular or T-cell defect. 
if they have infections in the skin, abscesses, uh, skin infections, lung abscesses, sinus, ear infections, and abscesses, consider granulocyte defects. This would be chronic granulomatous disease, uh, hyper IgM uh, syndrome with granu uh, granulocyte defects. Uh, especially in children, they may ha have unusual physical features, such as in the DeGeorge syndrome, uh, ataxia telangiectasia, for example, uh, the Wiscott Aldridge syndrome cartilage here, hypoplasia, and some of uh, the others. These are very rare. Uh, again, because this is an adult audience, I would point out that you don't see these physical features in adult immune deficiency patients. Mostly you see lots of infections, multiple hospitalizations, ear infections, sinus surgeries, et cetera. These are in adults. In young children, it's much easier to diagnose than in adults. Now, what about the uh, evaluation? And I'll spend most of the time talking about uh, antibody defects because these are the ones that you can treat. And these are the ones, if you recognize and treat early, can lead normal lives. So quantitative immunoglobulins are readily available uh, in Vietnam. And so if IgG particularly is low, uh, this should be a warning sign. And you would compare the levels with the normal age match levels. The person I trained under, Dr. Richard Steam, back in 1966, was responsible for developing the standards of levels for uh, age groups in children, and that table is still being used. Protein electrophoresis, an underutilized a test. I use this test all the time for both reasons. Number one, if they don't make antibody or they don't have gamma globulin, you will not see the gamma globulin spike. On the other hand, if they have recurrent infections and inflammation and they don't have antibody defects, oftentimes the gamma globulin will rise because it's an acute phase reaction. Uh, you can, as you can see way back in 1952 with Colonel Bruton, he did do antibody studies to, to the strep pneumonia. He did it to typhoid. Uh, he did it to uh, other uh, bacterial antigens, uh, including uh, we do against tetanus, we do against diphtheria. They use the Schick test. We don't use Schick test now. We do blood tests to look for antibodies against diphtheria. But I think the, if the Schick test were available, I think it's very practical, particularly in outlying communities in Vietnam. If the Schick test were available, they could use that as a screening test. Again, the Schick test is the diphtheria toxin. If they don't make antibodies to neutralize the toxin, there will be a red indurated mark. Uh, advanced tests, we would vaccinate against the various vaccines, uh, such as tetanus, uh, diphtheria, pneumococcus, hemophilus influenza, and then we would look at the antibody rise. So we would get titers before and four weeks after, and we would expect to see a fourfold rise. Uh, we can look at lymphocyte numbers. Uh, these are tests sometimes hard to get and expensive but we can look to see, are there enough lymphocytes? Are there enough T lymphocytes or cellular lymphocytes that are involved in cellular immunity? Uh, B cells, uh, for example, as in Brutons, Brutons, they don't make B cells. Uh, we now have even more sophisticated studies looking at genetics. The diagnosis in the United States and in Europe are now made by genetic analysis for primary immune deficiency. Uh, and also we can do B cell phenotyping and signaling. And in some of these individuals, they may have B cells, but the B cells don't work. And with B cell typing uh, and switching and memory, we can uh, find out that they may make B cells, but they don't work well. So finally, in the last couple of slides, several points to remember. While rare primary immune deficiency is a very serious problem with serious consequences if not suspected, diagnosed, and treated properly. And Dr. Hung can tell you, in the patients that were diagnosed later, these are children, they had bronchiectasis, they had chronic lung disease, they had meningitis, they had septic arthritis with permanent damage. I have seen some of these patients in the United States. And so they must be diagnosed early and they must be treated properly with gamma globulin replacement. 
aggressive use of antibiotics when needed and sometimes prophylactic antibiotics. Simple screening studies look at quantity and look at quality. So you can measure quantitative immunoglobulins. You can measure a CBC to make sure they have lymphocytes. You can get simple functional titers such as isohemagglutinins, which look at uh, blood types uh, against uh, polysaccharide blood types against red cells. Uh, you can do antistreptolysin O and antistreptolysin uh, H, or hyaluronidase, which is against the strep, strep group A. So this would be helpful uh, if you have laboratories that can do tetanus, diphtheria, uh, pertussis, measles, titers, that would be also helpful. One of the things that we've advocated in Vietnam, and I think uh, should be implemented not only in Vietnam, but in the United States, is that if you have these patients who keep coming into the hospital or who, who keep coming in with repeated ear infections or for ear infection surgery, uh, uh, ear surgery or sinus surgery in children, or they come in and they have pneumonia and ear infection, they should be automatically screened. Quantitative immunoglobulins can be automatically done uh, some functional titers can also be automatically done. And if these are abnormal, the doctor can be uh, notified. And the reason for this is that the doctors in Vietnam, as in the United States, are very busy. And so sometimes they just treat, the patient goes home, patient comes back again, they treat, the patient goes home again, and it goes on and on and on. I have had patients who were hospitalized at teenagers hospitalized six times with pneumonia before somebody finally thought they better screen. So it ha if it happens in the United States of America, it would happen in Europe, uh, in Asia, and elsewhere. Newborn screening is available primarily for the cellular deficiency, severe combined immunodeficiency. But I think if you have patients who have a positive family history, that is uh, male siblings who died early or had severe infections, you might want to screen uh, the, the newborn to see if they have IgM and later on continue to screen these individuals to see if they make uh, gamma globulin. Now, my colleagues in uh, the United States may disagree, but I would prefer that people focus on antibody deficiencies because it is far more common. Laboratory tests are available and it can be treated. The cellular deficiencies like combined immunodeficiency occur in one in 40,000 patients. With Scott Aldridge, uh, hyper IgM, et cetera, all of those are quite rare. And so those will not readily be seen. And if you see them, you should refer to them to the immunologist, infectious disease, or hematologist. If you see patients with severe infections, chronic infections, hard to treat infections, recalcitrant infections, or in family histories where they're positive and siblings uh, or family members may have died from infection, you should screen them and refer them to specialists. These children can be helped and there is treatment. And with Zoom, WebEx, and Microsoft GoToMeetings, consultation is available not only in the major centers uh, in Hanoi and uh, Ho Chi Minh City, but you can consult individuals uh, in Europe, the United States, uh, and in Asia. And so finally, uh, the Hawaiian saying, put your paddle in and join the effort. It is our hope and wish that both children in Vietnam as in the rest of the world, I am an uh, optimist, but I hope every child gets a healthy and happy life. Thank you very much to our colleagues. Thank you to Professor Chow and their hardworking group at the Respiratory a Society of Vietnam. Again, thank you to Professor Phan Mang Hung, uh, who has treated my wife and I very well. Thank you very much.